Welcome. My name is Tamar Gendler, and I'm a proud graduate of the Yale College class of 1987. I also have the extraordinary privilege of serving as the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Yale University. The Faculty of Arts and Sciences is the place where all of the departments and programs that offer courses in Yale College and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences sit. During the days when I was not Dean, I had the pleasure of serving as a professor of philosophy, of cognitive science, and of psychology, and of teaching a course that tried to bring together works from the ancient and early modern Western philosophical tradition with contemporary work in cognitive science and cognitive psychology. And I'm incredibly honored as an alumna, as a teacher, and as a Yale College parent to be hosting this panel today. The panel today brings together a group of women who were undergraduates at Yale College in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s, who went on to become faculty in the college and to teach students here at Yale. And it represents one of the many extraordinary milestones that we are celebrating in this 50 Women at Yale 150 celebration, the 50th anniversary of women in Yale College, the 150th anniversary of women at Yale University. Our session will last an hour. It will be recorded. So if you ask a question, know that the words that you say will be broadcast to others. And during the final 20 minutes, we'll reserve the conversation for our opportunity to respond to questions from you. So let me now introduce you to our five extraordinary panelists. Let me begin with Margaret Homans, Yale College class of 1974, professor of English and professor of women's gender and sexuality studies. In her courses and publications on Victorian, modern, and contemporary literature, Professor Homans has focused on women writers who explore questions of gender, sexuality, power, and identity, opening both to fellow academics and to undergraduates the ways in which these questions are addressed through literature. Let me introduce you second to Elizabeth Alexander, member of the Yale College class of 1984, poet, educator, memoirist, scholar, cultural advocate. Elizabeth Alexander has recently moved to a position as president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, one of the foundations that has played a central role in shaping the questions that American educational institutions are able to address. Prior to her time at the Mellon Foundation, Dr. Alexander taught at Yale for a decade and a half in English and African American studies and served as chair of the African American studies department. Third, let me introduce you to Ana Ramos Zayas, member of the Yale College class of 1990, professor of ethnicity, race, and migration, and professor of American studies and of anthropology. The work of Professor Ramos Zayas aims to understand and disentangle systems of power and privilege at a variety of scales, ranging from US imperial and white supremacist politics at the macroscopic level, to questions about how individuals and communities make sense of everyday forms of power and subordination. Fourth, I'm proud to introduce you to Beverly Gage, member of the Yale College class of 1994, professor of American history and director of the Brady Johnson Grand Strategy Program. Professor Gage's courses focus on American politics, on political thought, on social movements, and on governance broadly construed. Finally, 
Denise Ho, representing the New Century, member of the Yale College class of 2000, assistant professor of history at Yale and a scholar of 20th century Chinese history. Professor Ho is a historian of modern China with particular focus on the social and cultural history of China during the period of Mao. So as you can hear, this is a group diverse in its intellectual focus, diverse in its era of participation as a student at Yale, and diverse in its experiences. But what I want to do before we talk about the issues that I hope we can address today, the issues of women and education at a university like Yale, is just to give you a chance to get to know each of our panelists. So I want to start by asking you just to give a brief word picture of the 18-year-old you who arrived at Yale in 1970 or 1990 or 1996. Give us a little picture of who you were, what you were like, and then a little picture of who you are and what you do now so that as we tell the rest of the stories we tell, our audience has an understanding of who they are hearing from. And I'll do this piece in chronological order by graduation year. So let me begin with Margaret Holman. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be in this company. When I arrived at Yale in September of 1970, I was a very naive 17-year-old. I had come from a progressive, urban, co-educated high school. I was completely unprepared for the all-male student body, all-male faculty, all-male culture of Yale. The things I was excited about about Yale were two, principally. I was excited about studying literature, and I was excited about coming to the place where May Day had just happened. Um, in those days, activism primarily meant the Black Panthers and anti-war activism. Um, but Yale turned me into a feminist because I had to do something in response to the extraordinary androcentrism of everything that I encountered. Um, so I learned how to combine my love of literature with my feminism and my advocacy for queer activism. Um, and that enabled me to um, enjoy a long and fruitful career as professor of English and of women's gender and sexuality studies. Um, but I must thank Yale for um, causing me to become a feminist scholar because I'm not sure that in a more congenial environment that would have happened. Thank you, Margaret. Let me turn next to Elizabeth Alexander. Elizabeth. I just muted me, but now you can hear me. Sorry about that. Um, I came to Yale in 1980 from Washington, D.C. Uh, I came as a very serious ballet and modern dancer, and within two weeks of not getting into the Yale dancers, which at the time felt like the biggest tragedy in the world. Uh, a woman uh, named Carol walked across campus, saw me and one of my roommates and said, hey, big girls, come and get in the boat. And so within moments, within weeks, I was, uh, I was a crew, uh, I was on the crew team, having never done it before with mostly people who had never done it before. And so, and, and still, still dancing and still mourning that, that, that loss, but realizing and this to the sort of what happened at Yale part of the story, that you could very quickly reinvent yourself, but that reinvention didn't have to mean leaving everything behind. Yale at the time was a place where um, feminism was very much in the air. Uh, the work and the activism and then the teaching that Margaret and many of her colleagues did allowed those of us who came, I think, in 1980 to feel as though we belonged there, even though we had only been there for basically a decade. 
Um, that didn't mean that there weren't lots and lots of struggles and things to push and things to ask to be different. I was also very involved with African American studies and what I learned with African American studies and with the feminist atmosphere that was also in the writers who were being published at that moment, who we were reading, we would drive to Bridgeport, get a car from someone, drive to Bloodroot uh, feminist bookstore and restaurant and eat a delicious uh, vegetarian meal and come back with Home Girls, a black feminist anthology when it was hot off the presses, you know, of course, no Amazon, no other way to get these essential texts. We brought Audre Lorde to talk at school, imagine, imagine, imagine. Um, so it felt like a very alive time where um, um, black studies and uh, and feminist studies were intersecting, but we also understood that in order to come to voice, we had to challenge the university, that it wasn't going to center the things that we thought were so important unless we pushed, unless we asked, unless we marched, unless we spoke up in class. And that was the challenge, but I think that was what, when you look ahead to coming back after many, many years away, I didn't think I was gonna go to graduate school when I left. I left and became a newspaper reporter, but in a year I was back in school. Uh, and uh, and the, the true joy and privilege of who I was as a teacher was someone who understood profoundly, and this is true in my work at the Mellon Foundation now too, that to love an institution is to challenge it. And that that's what it means to be a citizen of a place. Fantastic, Elizabeth. Beverly, paint us a picture of your 18-year-old self arriving at Yale and contrast her with the current Beverly Gage and a little picture of her as well. Right. Well, I think we're going slightly out of order now. Because I think oh, I'm sorry. I double jumped over Anna. We'll go back and pick up Anna in a minute. Um, so my story, which I hadn't realized, is a little bit similar to Elizabeth's. Um, in the sense that I came here kind of as an arts kid. Um, I have been very serious about classical music. I grew up outside of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a big classical music town. And I really came to Yale because Yale seemed like mm, the campus among all of the Ivies that had this vibrant artistic life. It had a school of drama, it had a school of music, it had a school of art, and it had this kind of mm, lively uh, culture of the arts among undergrads. And so that was my draw, I think, in coming here. Once I got here, uh, I kind of threw all of that out the window. And I do think for me, as for many people, it became a place of reinvention. Um, like Elizabeth, so you can't tell because we're on Zoom, but I'm about <laughs> six feet tall. And when you show up at Yale and you're a woman and you're <laughs> six feet tall, the freshman crew coach says, you. He sits on old campus and plucks all the... So uh, I did that. I don't think I lasted nearly as long as Elizabeth, but I gave it, I gave it a good try for a few months. Um, but over the course of my time at Yale, I really moved in much more to the study of history and politics and activism. I think, um, you know, one of the enlivening forces really was my classes, and that's probably true for all of us. That's how we all ended up back uh, being professors. But, uh, but it was also in some ways the pull of New Haven. Um, I remember the 90s, the early 90s being a pretty vibrant moment for activism in ways that I think uh, people don't necessarily remember. And I think for our generation, you know, I was born in 1972 which means that I was born the year that the first class of undergraduate women graduated from Yale. Um, so we were really a full generation out at that point. So it seemed very unremarkable that we were here. Uh, on the other hand, we could see all the ways in which that had changed very quickly, but a lot of the rest of the institution uh, hadn't changed uh, particularly quickly at all. So since that moment, I have stayed, I think, firmly ensconced in the history, government, politics end of things, uh, rather than in uh, the musical end of things. But I still appreciate that, 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 uh, that all of this is around us at Yale. Good, and now jumping back to the person I should by my own rules have called on, Anna, class of 1990. Hi, um, thank you. So I'm from Santurce, Puerto Rico, and my parents just took me to the airport, I remember. Um, I had never been on a flight of my own. I had been on very few flights in general. Um, 
so, and I hadn't seen Yale at all, other than from the brochures that we did have back then that were in paper instead of everything online. And I remember some friends of my parents from Queens drove me and dropped me off at Phelps Gate. And to be honest, for the first, probably the first semester, if not the first year, I felt that I lived in a movie. I had seen many of these movies about college life in the U.S. dubbed in Spanish. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, this is like a movie. And Hardness Tower would like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm in a movie. So it did feel like being a character of a movie, which um, was interesting on many levels. And I think that I became more grounded once I found the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. At the time, it was called the Casa Julia de Burgos. It's still called that. And I became very active in the Yale New Haven um, connections um, through, you know, Wilbur Cross and doing volunteer work in New Haven. Um, I spent a lot of time explaining uh, what liberal arts was and how I was intending to get a job after graduating um, to my family. So they were it's like, what are you going to do with that? So I ended up majoring in economics, thinking that within the liberal arts, that would be the most uh, likely that would lead to a job. And I did work at the Department of, of um, the Treasury uh, in Puerto Rico for a few months before deciding that I needed to go back to grad school in, in anthropology. So it's a big shift. Um, my time at Yale um, was deeply characterized by the anti-apartheid struggle. And I remember feeling that sense of just joy and power and a sense of, of possibility um, through through that struggle as well, and developing the commonalities between different aspects of Puerto Rican struggle and struggles of other um, people of color throughout the global South and the world. Um, and that really marked my intellectual interest more than my major. So my major was economics, my intellectual um, interest became more uh, Latin American studies and anthropology and all of that. Um, the, just even being aware of words in English and slang in English. I mean, I think we had grown up um, learning English like for an hour uh, a day, you know, so you know the basic stuff, but just like to get used to people's abbreviations and calling things different. It, it just took a while, but, uh, but it really transformed my life. I mean, I never knew what you could be. I never knew that you could do a PhD. I never knew that you could actually make a living um, with some, something that you loved. Right. I mean, I was prepared to make a living with like by, uh, through sacrifice, but not through joy. And um, I think that that's the greatest gift. Um, that's a gift that I just hope to pass on to my students, um, even to my to my child, you know, like just pass on to, to, to people. And so I'm very appreciative for that. I mean, the struggles are continuous um, and I, I am in a department that that very very aware of that so so I'm also part of that kind of trying to change the institution that you love uh, piece. Denise introduce us to Denise Ho age 17 or 18 upon arrival. Sure um so I arrived at Yale in the fall of 1996 I was from California I was by myself and I had a duffel bag and a suitcase um I was in directed studies and calculus uh, I think at that time I, I came in thinking I would be a political science major and maybe become a diplomat, but I, I realized I didn't really know what that meant or how I was going to get there. Um, I think what was transformative was actually directed studies and I was um, a Tamar student in philosophy in the spring of 1997. Uh, and I, I think that it just introduced me to the history of ideas and uh, to the possibility of becoming intellectual and, and to be able to think and, as Anna said, to make a living doing what you love or studying what you love. Um, so I think uh, over the years at Yale, I was the, the sort of person who was at the library waiting for it to open on, on Sunday morning uh, because that's where I would go to read. Um, so since then, I've uh, gone on and studied Chinese history and um, worked, um, as, as Tamar said, on social and cultural history of modern China. And currently, I'm really interested in the history of, um, of cities and of borders. So my new work is on uh, the relationship between Hong Kong and China. Those are wonderful stories. I also showed up as a 17-year-old in the fall of 1983. I had been a high school student at the prep school Phillips Academy where I had always felt like an 
outsider because unlike Elizabeth and Bev, I'm not six feet tall. In fact, I am just barely a bit over five feet tall. And I always felt short and Jewish and like an outsider. And I thought if I came to campus, everybody would just think I had come from Andover and I was this prep school girl and that I could suddenly somehow pass as WASP, which is the most unlikely thing imaginable for somebody whose name is Tamar, among other things. But I came with the general thought that it was a time to have a new slate, the idea that you could start over again. And even though my ambitions to be somebody who represented prep school turned out to be both incompatible with what I wanted to do and incompatible with what I could do, I ended up finding it to be a place that was a source of intellectual adventure. I came expecting to be a math major. My fall semester of my freshman year was devoted to walking to what we call the land of mathematics, LOM, to do Math 230. I ended up majoring in math and philosophy and also something called the humanities major, which was basically a three-year version of directed studies where you did medieval for a year, renaissance for a year, and modern for a year. But the opportunity to take what had been seeded in me at, at Andover, which was the idea that ideas matter and that ideas are part of what shapes the world in a way that is palpable to all, and that that could be explored in such a wide range of disciplines was, was really magical. So one of the questions I want to ask you is what extracurricular or co-curricular aspect of the institution sustained you? So in my own case, I was sustained by the Yale Debate Association. I got here as a freshman. I tried out for the team. The coaches were a man named Eric Molenicki and a woman named Pam Carlin, who went on to be one of the most distinguished professors of law at Stanford now. And for me, it was a group of people. We practiced probably three or four nights a week. We traveled every weekend. I went to Princeton or we would drive up to Harvard or we would drive to West Point or wherever the tournaments were being held. And being able to do something with a cohort of people over those four years, debate in particular, was for me one of the most important elements of my time at Yale. Margaret, maybe we'll go again, I'll get chronological correct this time and you can talk about something that sustained you in the form of community? Well, the first thing I want to say is my women friends. Coming from a co-ed school, I had had friends of both or possibly even all genders, although that was not a concept in the 70s, I mean in the 60s. Um, but at Yale, it became quickly clear that um, the few women that you could make strong bonds with would save your life. And so strong, a few strong women friendship, friendships with women, and also um, the places at Yale where women gathered. Um, the, there was a New Haven Women's Center that was housed in a Yale building. And in the New Haven Women's Center was an outfit called the Women's Abortion Referral Service. This was in the days before Roe v. Wade. And um, we helped um, arrange for women with small economic means in New Haven to obtain abortions either in New Haven or in New York. And um, it was extremely important work, I felt. It took me both deeper into Yale and outside of Yale because the institution was both in Yale and out of Yale. Um, and it gave me a sense of the broader aims of um, political feminist activism um, that I hadn't seen before. And there was one harrowing night when I had borrowed a very bad car to drive a group of women to a clinic in New York and it started to snow. And I thought, what am I doing? But we all made it back alive. Um, and that kind of mission, although my academic work was extremely important to me, and I'll talk about that when we get to that round of questions, um, that kind of activism done with and for women um, was so valuable to me. Um, there was also the Slavic chorus. There were very few women's, um, uh, or maybe none, uh, uh, singing groups. And I did not have the skills to be in the Slavic chorus, but I knew people in it and I loved their concerts. Um, 
So that was, that was at the beginning of the formation of uh, groups for women to have solidarity with one another. Elizabeth, what sustained you co-curricularly? This I did myself. Uh, also, um, women, friends, uh, and uh, very importantly, uh, multi-ethnic women, friends, all of whom were talking out of and learning uh, our ethnicities in a way that we could share. You know, the things that we lived, we were reading books about. Sometimes that wasn't always in class. Uh, so I think that having a really uh, heavy and intense autodidactic practice that you share with friends was crucial. If they weren't teaching Lucille Clifton in the English department, which they weren't, uh, then you go read that book and talk about it with your friends. And then when you realize what, how the resources of an extraordinarily resourced institution can be used in your way, I think about in 1983, I'm sure Margaret remembers this, the Black Women Writers Conference uh, at Yale, where, uh, you know, some of us students work together to bring Alice Walker, Buccia Macheda, I mean, you know, Black women writers from all over the world using the university's resources. So that was part of being friends together. Uh, house parties was a part of being friends together, uh, where we made the food that we missed and danced the dances that we missed. And uh, that was a very important and great joy. Um, the corner of College Street, 493 College Street, the Naples corner, that whole orbit was crucial. African-American studies was at 493 College and there were graduate students at the time, you could get a master's in African-American studies, but you um, would often then go into the English department for your PhD or American studies for your PhD to finish doing your work in African-American studies. And, and the most brilliant, my first concept of graduate students, I never met a graduate student, but here were these extraordinary people talking on the corner for hours. There in Naples is Wole Soyenka. He's come from Nigeria. He's in residence. He's, he's drinking an espresso. You know what he looks like. You've read his books. Maybe you can go over and talk to him. So the magnetic, intellectual, spiritual pull of that corner was community unto itself. Um, and then I would also connect that to, and this is where the kind of, the per, all, all this is the personal and the scholarly overlapping, uh, to the Beinecke. Um, because in African American studies, having the James Weldon Johnson collection at the time, uh, just about the most extraordinary collection of black uh, 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 humanities, black literary culture in an archive. So there were all of our ancestral friends. And it felt like that. If you could go see the first handwritten page of Their Eyes Were Watching God, when you were reading it for the first time and reading that coming of age story as you yourself as a young black woman were coming of age, that certainly Zora Neale Hurston in the archive was my friend. Amazing story. Anna, what sustained you co-curricularly? Just wanted to say, like Elizabeth, um, the Beinecke still feels that way, which is one of those things that um, some things are discontinuous, but some there's some con continuity among um, the, through the through the years, I think, also. Um, I initially sought out um, Morehouse, um, the Catholic Center, because I had gone to Catholic school I mean, more culturally Catholic than religious, but I had gone to Catholic school for 12 years and there had been a nun who was my math teacher, algebra, whose mother had um, was part of Morehouse. So she had connected and she hooked me up with, with that. Um, and I found some friends through there, but in reality, I feel that it was, it was the, the cultural center Cultural centers, I should say, because I also feel that even though Puerto Rican Cultural Center was self-standing at that point, the connection with Mecha, with AFAM, with, with all the cultural centers was really, really tight. And, uh, and through, the cultural through the cultural center, I was able to do a lot of other activities that, that are part of my Yale um, experience and memory. Um, the connection with Wilbur Cross, as I say, I mean, I still stay in touch with who was my little sister at the time in the little sister, big sister program. 
Uh, she's a wonderful artist in Barcelona. Um, I mean, just unbelievable trajectory, but that's another story in itself. Um, and also, I ended up being um, an ethnic counselor, which now is called Proco. But back then, um, I think there, you know, so, um, I, and it's, again, some of the people who were my counselees at the time remain to this day, my, my good friends. Um, so most of that um, was also that blend between the personal and the political involvement and the intellectual um, process. All of that for me was just cohere around um, around that. I mean, I, I for the first time I actually heard. I mean, I, I had been grow, I had grown up in Puerto Rico, so I learned more about the Puerto Rican experience in the U.S. through my friends who had been raised in Chicago or in New York, um, and noticed the similarities. So I I feel that such a great part of who I am, even at that level, came from that uh, connection to Yale. Um, and that those experiences in extracurricular activities. So, yeah. Bev, how about in your case? Yeah, I, I feel that my, my co-panelists here may have been better college students than I was, um, which is to say, I will plead that it was the early 90s and I uh, adopted a somewhat disaffected, <laughs> um, slightly scornful sometimes uh, attitude toward a lot of things that I now would look back on and say, I can't believe I didn't get involved uh, with that. Um, and uh, it's somewhat amusing to me because um, I run a program now, Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy, which attracts, you know, the most ambitious ambitious, focused, you know, kind of make their way in the world students. And I, I was not at all like that as an undergraduate. So um, I did some stuff at Yale. I was the assistant director of the Glee Club, which was an, an interesting community. It was sort of the last vestiges of my, uh, of my musical past. Um, but I spent a lot of time actually in, the, I guess I would say the intellectual circles that were uh, at Yale, but a little bit adjacent to Yale. So, um, one of the things that I think helped make me into an adult was was hanging out at a uh, cafe that no longer exists, the Daily Cafe, which was right next to campus. It's now, uh, I guess it's a noodle shop now. Um, but that was for the early 90s, a really kind of interesting, vibrant place that had a lot of Yale people there. It had a lot of people from the community. It was a place where people were talking about politics and activism and the philosophy kids were sitting there doing the extra reading, right? The non-required reading just because uh, you were sort of immersed in that. And so um, I would say that that culture, which is was both on campus and off campus, um, and really was about a sort of, I wouldn't say autodidactic, but, uh, but um, a slightly independent intellectual culture that was enormously appealing to me. Um, it was where I first learned to write and to be a journalist. There used to be this newspaper called the New Haven Advocate, which you would walk into a cafe like that and Alternative Weekly would be sitting there and I interned at the Advocate and kind of learned to write there and exploring New Haven. So um, I think that was, that was my space of vibrancy and sustenance as an undergrad. Denise, how about you at the end of our list on this question. Sure. Um, so I, I think I'll answer the question in two ways. So directly, Tamar, your question is about extracurriculars. And I confess that my extracurricular activity uh, was not very, uh, we took it seriously, but it sounds a lot less serious than some of the others presented on the panel. I was a competitive ballroom dancer. So I was on the Yale ballroom dance team. Um, and I think it was, uh, tremendously fun and exciting in part because it's something that no one had any background in. So everybody was starting from scratch. Um, everybody was helping each other. Because we weren't in Boston or New York, we didn't have access to um, a, a lot of coaches. Um, so it was something that was this equalizer and also a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, so that was what I spent my time doing uh, as an undergraduate. Um, the other piece of your question, I think, has to do with identity. And a lot of people have talked about uh, the people who were their friends. And as I was reflecting on this, I, I didn't really understand this until I was at graduation and looking at all the parents of my friends, people we were taking pictures with in Brantford. I think that one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the biggest commonalities among my friends at Yale was 
justice uh, being the, the children of immigrants, um, whether they were Greek or um, Vietnamese or, uh, or from Mexico. Um, and the, the sense of being um, a first generation American and figuring out how to belong and figuring out how to navigate dual identities uh, was very strong among, among my friends. So all of us grew up to become professors and academics. And presumably there was a moment at Yale or a series of moments at Yale that gripped us so powerfully intellectually that we decided we wanted to spend our lives doing that. And I remember in particular taking a logic course with a woman named Ruth Marcus, who was the only woman in the philosophy department for many years and was by any description of the term formidable, self-confident in her views that she understood the world, but also extraordinarily inspiring and present. And she gave me through the rigor of her thought and the certainty of the legitimacy of her presence in that department, the sense that philosophy and in particular analytic philosophy was a place that women belonged. And so when I got to graduate school at Harvard a few years later, and I met a woman named Chris Korsgaard, who was the first tenured woman in the Harvard philosophy department. And she told me the story that there was a tenured faculty bathroom that was for the tenured faculty only, right? There was, uh, you think there's hierarchy at Yale, Harvard, Harvard beats that in Emerson Hall. There was the non-tenured, there was the student bathroom the non-tenured faculty bathroom and the tenured faculty bathroom. And of course, for Chris to come in and integrate the tenured faculty bathroom was actually considered a major incursion. And that was a surprise to me because Lips Marcus's presence in the philosophy department at Yale in Connecticut Hall for all of the ways in which she was, I came to learn subsequently a complicated, polarizing, controversial figure on campus. She was, for me, an instance of what it was to be certain about the value of the life of the mind. So maybe we'll run in the opposite order and do sort of quick catch on this question. Denise, idea or person that just captured you intellectually as an undergraduate? And then we'll go back, Bev, Anna, Elizabeth, Margaret. The transformative class for me uh, was actually a class um, on the diary of uh, Joshua Hempstead, who was a 17th century uh, farmer in London, Connecticut. It was taught by John Demos, and we spent the entire uh, semester working on that diary. We got to, uh, we got a bus and went to New London and looked at the original diary. So um, several people have talked about the moment of being in the archives. So the moment of being with the manuscript and seeing when he recorded um, his wife passing away with our gloves on, it was, it was tremendous. And it really made me think about um, uh, history as a way to touch the humanity of people in different times and places. Good. That's a great story. I read America at 1750 in high school and thought he was the really an inspiring historian. Bev. I don't know that I would point to uh, a single class, but I was an American studies major. And uh, the American studies curriculum at that time was, it was history, it was literature mainly. Um, but what was really enlivening to me about it was uh, the sense that what I was learning was making the world so much more interesting to me. Um, and that the pieces that I could take from class, I could now understand the buildings around me differently, I could understand the community around me differently, I could read the news differently. Um, and so that sense of, of vibrancy and connection, I guess, between uh, the present and the past was, was quite thrilling. Uh, as a senior, I decided, you know, uh, that I was going to do a project that was going to combine all of these things. It was kind of a, a perfect American Studies senior essay project. I was teaching in a women's prison um, up the road in Niantic, Connecticut. I was teaching a writing class there that I had no idea what I was doing, but I had put together because I thought that this was, so I was going to write this grand senior essay that was going to be about women's prison literature, 
but I was also going to bring in the literature from the class that I was teaching. And then I was also going to have my own kind of like memoir piece to it that was going to be the story of my own exploration. So it's going to be literary criticism, all these things. And as you can imagine, that all fell apart in about February. <laughs> Uh, and I did an entirely different senior essay. But what I appreciate is just that sense uh, that there was all of this open space um, that you were going to have the resources and the support to try to to try to put these things uh, these things together and make those connections. And that was just enormously thrilling to me as a as a young person. Fantastic story, Anna. Yes, um, I'm thinking that there wasn't one moment either. I mean, there were several, but I, I do remember that the first time that I cried over poetry was at Yale. Um, I had always been very dismissive of poetry, and I guess, you know, my high school didn't stand out for the poetry teaching. But I remember uh, listening to Pedro Pietri's uh, Puerto Rican mm -hmm. obituary uh, in, uh, in a Puerto Rican uh, literature class that was taught by a graduate student who was in, in American studies at the time. Um, and that was just so moving because everybody, after one of the students read it, everybody was just like tearing. And, and it's just like this, I was like, wow, you, some, some, a piece of writing can do that. And that was like one, one of those moments of that, that I in, in, like noticed it right there, but didn't retrieve that moment until much later. Um, you know, I didn't know that I was going to do a PhD until I was in it already. Um, I thought I want to do I want to do a master's degree, but in order for me to get finance, I like I can't afford a master's degree, so I'll just apply for a PhD. And I went to Columbia and I applied, you know, for the PhD program, thinking that I would do the two years and then I would drop out. I mean, honestly. And so what ended up happening was that I, as part of my training ended up in anthropology, I ended up going to Chicago and taught at, a, at an alternative school in, in the city in Chicago and learning the power of teaching there, but teaching in a different way. I mean, I remember that I came with my Yale expectations of teaching and classroom participation and all of that. And, and the director of that school told me, you know, these kids are in gangs, their parents don't have food, they don't have a roof. I think you need to tailor your expectations of this and do them in a way that is meaningful to people. And that moment also was transformative in making me decide that maybe I can stay in the PhD program and do what I want. Um, so it was that combination of elements, I think. You know, it, I, I did not follow a very straight path to, to, to the PhD. I really went, I, I, I avoided it and avoided it until it kind of took me over. So, yeah. Margaret, um, um, intellectual moment that you remember. You want to go to Elizabeth first? Uh, sorry, I keep losing track of my list. Let me go to Elizabeth and then Margaret. Elizabeth. Um, well, what I would just say um, briefly is that while we don't necessarily, so I, again, didn't know I wanted to be a professor, but knew that I was uh, excited by books and ideas, um, but there were only two black women on the faculty at that time, Sylvia Boone and Hazel Carby. So not that we can only imagine ourselves uh, in the image of others who are like ourselves, but it is very important to say that. Um, uh, so there was that. Um, as far as um, intellectual excitement, the late Michael Cook uh, was someone who uh, I had been to, to talk to a professor in the English department who said to me, and I said, I'm kind of thinking, interested in, in African American literature, what classes should I take? And was told nothing worth reading was written after 1600. Um, and so I was like, hmm, okay. And I walked out of her office and I looked and there was this long single typed on long paper problems in the study of African American literature, a graduate course taught by Michael Cook, a course that I later went on to teach myself, which was an amazing thing. Um, and so I went to uh, Mr. Cook and uh, sort of didn't say anything about being an undergraduate and he said, I want you to read this story and go away and come back and then I'm going to ask you questions about it. So it was like a proper, you know, can you be in this class? And then once I was in that class, um, the world um, just opened up and part of it was from how he talked about literature and talked about books in the context. I'll never forget the first time I heard John Coltrane, heard anyone talk about John Coltrane was when Michael Cook was teaching us Michael Harper's poetry. Dear John, dear Coltrane. And he said, you need to know all of this together. 
Um, and then finally also um, having um, Skip Gates as a professor. Um, and in keeping with our important theme of loving and challenging institutions, this was right before he didn't get tenure at Yale. Um, you know, so institutions make mistakes sometimes. Um, uh, but um, having him working as a research assistant for him on the Black Periodical Fiction Project and going through the microfilm, looking through 19th century publications in the library to find um, serialized writing by Black women and realizing that there hadn't been books written about these books that were written and forgotten in the 19th century. So seeing that, wow, you could continually discover. Um, and then I just have to also add, Judith Butler was a graduate student in philosophy and the only philosophy class I taught was when she taught philosophy and feminism for the first time. And what I learned there was like rock star teaching. You know, she was a grad student, she was brilliant, she was amazing, she was breaking open the field and there were hundreds of us in that room. And it was very, very hard, and I'm not sure I even understood it, but I understood, as you said earlier, Tamar, like ideas power the world, ideas matter, and learning can be exhilarating. Fantastic. I'm gonna let Margaret answer. We then have some questions from the audience that I'll pose to us, and those we can have maybe two or three of us answer each one and, and so that we get to a number of them. So let me turn to Margaret and then I have a question from the audience about what work remains to be done to include women in the intellectual and creative life of the university. So you might think about that and if a couple of you want to volunteer through hand raise to let me know you'll answer that. I'll turn to that after I hear Margaret's intellectual inspiration. Margaret. So I'll try and be quick because we need to get to the future. But um, uh, in 1970, Yale was the place to go to study literature. Um, but it was completely taught by men. Um, there were a few women on the faculty, but they were either untenured and certain not to get tenure, or they were the highly accomplished, amazing wives of men who had tenured positions, but the wives had been given positions as lecturer. Um, so uh, I, for me, it was negative and positive. As I said, um, the experience of being immersed in this completely male world um, was typified by the dominance of Harold Bloom in those days, for whom literature was an agon between fathers and sons. And that was, it was fascinating and he was so exciting, but there was no place for women. And I remember in my junior or senior year, um, being in a seminar with him, and there were a lot of women English majors. Um, and he told us that all of us who had long hair, which included me, um, many of us had long hair that we, secretly cared a lot about, despite feminism, um, that we were styling ourselves after pre-Raphaelite portraiture of women. So the place for women was as beautiful objects. And so my intellectual project began there. I was just irate at the omission of women as writers and as scholars. And um, my uh, first year teacher for literature, Thomas Weiskel, um, enabled one of the other women students in the class and I to write a senior, a, a final paper on Gertrude Stein instead of on one of the dead white men that everybody else had to write about. Stein was not in the curriculum, um, but we were allowed to do this. And that was an extraordinarily enabling thing. He was also the first person who showed me an article about feminist literary criticism in 1971. Um, so there was, a, there was a window open there um, through a lovely young male professor. Um, and then I finally wrote a dissertation about women writers in the romantic period that was a kind of autobiography because I was trying to figure out how did women writers cope with the overwhelmingly male subject matter and method of um, prestige writing in those days. Um, and it was a way of thinking about my own position in the literary academy. Um, so that was both a negative and a starting point and a, and a positive starting point for me. These are great stories and they have elicited from our audience questions. So I mentioned that the first one is about ways in which the academy needs to change to accommodate women or to accommodate issues that women's experience have brought to the front. So 
when I was teaching the directed study seminar for Denise, I was pregnant with my son, a uh, member of the Yale College class of 2020. And by the end of the semester, my husband was teaching at Cornell that year. I was commuting with the steering wheel very, very far from my hands. And I gave birth over the summer. And then when my son was five weeks old, I went to start teaching my class at the university where I was teaching, which was then Syracuse. There wasn't the thought, it didn't occur to me to ask for a kind of accommodation. And the experience of women over the intervening two decades actually brought to the academy's attention that faculty are human beings and that parenting is done still largely by women, but also by parents of other genders. And accommodating the need for faculty and staff to be able to have lives as caregivers is one of the ways in which the academy has adapted, perhaps not as fully as it can, but adapted in the face of a lesson that was brought to the fore by the absence of women from the faculty. And I wonder whether a couple of you, if you use the hand raise function, want to respond to the question, what work remains to be done to include women in the intellectual and creative life of the university? How, and how can those lessons open the academy more broadly? So Bev and then Margaret on that question. Bev. Yeah, so I think that in many ways, um, Yale is a lot of different Yales, and I think a lot of people would say that. And so uh, there are certain areas where, I mean, Tamar, you know these statistics better than anyone at this point, right? You can look at the number of women faculty. Uh, it got stuck somewhere for a while. It seems to be going up. Uh, it's certainly not 50-50. Not but I guess one of the things that I would say experientially uh, about being on the faculty of the institution now is that um, how much I feel my gender identity, how much uh, I feel inside or outside uh, based on that really just depends on the environment that I'm in. And there are certain parts of the campus uh, that uh, where it's entirely unremarkable to be a female faculty member. There are other parts of the campus where I still walk into rooms and I'm kind of surprised every time at this point, but where I'm the only woman in the room. Um, and so I think actually to think about making change at the institution uh, some of those pieces need to be need to be picked apart a little bit. Um, and one of the things that is of some concern to me, um, and, and this panel reflects, I guess, a little bit of this, is that women's faculty power now uh, resides much more heavily in the in the humanities, um, a little bit less in the social sciences and probably least in the sciences, though tomorrow you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but as women have come to be more and more present in the humanities, and I think we may even have a department that is more than 50% women faculty now, uh, art history, or at least that's what the Yale Daily News says, so asterisk, but, um, but it's at the moment that the humanities are also losing a lot of status, they're losing a lot of power, they're losing a lot of appeal, uh, they're, they're in crisis, and I have spent some time puzzling out exactly what the relationship between those two pieces might be. What is the chicken? What is the egg? Is this coincidence? Are there some set of historical forces at work? And you know, I think the, the slight shift away from the humanities has been uh, one of the big changes from my time as an undergrad to now, um, though Yale is still a pretty uh, vibrant humanities campus. Um, and that seems to me somewhat related to gender and kind of where power rests at the university. Um, I thought other panelists might have have better answers to that, uh, what remains of the question for me. Yeah, let me call on Margaret and then I'll say a bit about the demographic data to which Bev adverts. Margaret. Yeah, I just wanted to say something quick about the student body, which is so much more diverse now than it was in 1970. It's just inconceivable. And I feel that changes in my own teaching and therefore in my scholarship have often come about because of pushing and provocation from undergraduates. Um, 
I have long taught feminist and queer theory, um, but I quickly became a teacher of feminist, queer, and transgender theory because the students were irate that I was not doing this. Um, this is a very new field. And um, students pushed and pushed in the fall of 2015, as we all know, um, to um, uh, make ethnicity, race, and migration and other programs at Yale that advocate for uh, diversity uh, stronger financially and institutionally that came from the students. And um, so I would say one of the things that Yale has done absolutely best um, is its admissions policy. Um, and I just hope that it will go on um, creating these extraordinary classes of diverse um, uh, students who push us all in the right directions. So I will just say a little bit about Bev's remark. And then for the closing question, we're coming up near the end. I'm going to ask Denise, Elizabeth, and Anna each to respond to a question we have from the audience about advice for those in the audience who are parents of young women who are not yet even young women, parents of K-12 to girls, about the ways in which during this time of upheaval in education, we can provide them with grounding that lets them stay committed to the value of ideas. So what would you say to a young daughter is, is the question from that colleague. Just quickly by way of some of the data to which Bev adverted, two striking things. One, if we look at our faculty by cohort and years since PhD, about 10% of the faculty in the oldest cohort identify as women. That is, it's 90% people who identify as men and 10% people who identify as women. As we move down by decade, it's about 10 percentage points a, a decade. So 20%, 30%, 40%. And in our most recent cohort, we're roughly 50-50. It is not distributed equally across fields. Though one of the things that is exciting is that in the last five years, in the biological sciences, our hiring has been fully 50-50 on gender. And even in the physical sciences, the area in which we're least represented in our women faculty in the physical sciences and engineering, it's been above a third of the faculty who have come in who have identified as women. And we see that change. There's now none of our science and engineering departments that has only one woman. We just hired our second tenured woman mathematician. And we are working, we're not obsessed with getting exact balance across the board, but what we want is what Elizabeth mentioned, which is the presence of people whose embodiment and intellectual subject matter allow others to feel the possibility of that kind of cohabitation, that you can be both at once. So let me take us out on the question from the audience of advice to the next generation. Denise, and then Anna, and then Elizabeth. Denise. Uh, thanks for that great question. I was, um, I've been thinking about this in terms of uh, the Yale classroom and then outside of the Yale classroom. Because I feel that at least in my experience over the last five years teaching at Yale, I, I don't sen sense a strong uh, difference in gender and speaking up and being confident in class. And so the puzzle for me is once that student or once that young woman graduates, how does she have that same sense of confidence in the workplace, in the wider world, when there isn't an instructor there who knows who's done the reading and who hasn't? Um, so how do you carry that or how do you cultivate a sense of confidence and then carry that with you after you graduate? Um, so my advice to the young woman is to, or to the, to the daughter, um, is to be confident in what you know. And so I think our job as educators is to um, help our students, um, both male and female, to figure out how to find evidence and how to stand behind it and how to make arguments and, and how to defend them so that they can have that confidence uh, once they leave uh, the, the Yale classroom. Fantastic. Anna, advice? As a, as a parent, I never give advice on parenting, and that sounded like really close, <laughs> but I'll make an exception. Um, I did research on parenting very recently on upper class parents in Latin America. And one of the things that I've noticed is that the higher up in the class racial hierarchy, 
the least we notice distinctions between how women and men are afforded um, or are, are raised more equitably. So I think that that's just to say that it's important to be intersectional about all those things um, instead of just being very general. But one of the things, but, but another thing that I wanted to, to point to is that, you know, a lot of times we just expect um, women in the classroom to be doing the gender work. And, and even, if, even if it is not intentional, and I think we need to hold everybody accountable for doing that work. Um, and so I would say that rather than give any kind of um, directive of how to, you know, what to advise parents of, of women, I think it's just all parents to make aware, to be aware that these issues need to be take on by, by everybody. I mean, it's not only a matter of raising daughters in a particular way. I mean, we have to raise sons in a particular way. We have to raise, you know, every child in, in, in this new way of being more aware of justice and what justice looks like. So. Elizabeth. Um, I'll just follow right on what you were talking about, Anna, because I was um, going to say, I think we have to expand the question to include all of our, uh, all of our children. Um, not, I happen to have two sons, but um, I think that um, we want all of our children to understand that the world is an abundant place and the world is a tremendously unjust place and that those things exist at once. I think we wanna teach all of our kids to be both questioners, avid questioners, incessant questioners and listeners. Uh, and that's certainly one thing as a, as a teacher, I could say to my kids is like, don't be that one who gets on my nerves, who doesn't listen to anybody. <laughs> um, and sometimes those are, you know, it, it's not always, it's not always um, the boys actually. Um, uh, so um, to be questioners and to be listeners. I think that also because we're speaking in a Yale alumni context, um, and so we're talking about young people who are the children of, of, of Yale alums. Um, what does it mean in a rich way to understand your privilege? What does it mean in a rich way to understand that a room that you may be in, every time you're in a room, someone else is not in that room? So how do you literally and metaphorically bring other people into that room? I think it is a tremendous gift that it's very important from a privileged position to say, that we all have to work hard for what, what we have, but that privilege doesn't make you any more special than anybody else, which I think is sometimes hard because there's so much that we want for our children. We want our children for the world to be, to be their oyster, but uh, it's not worth having the world as your oyster uh, if the world uh, remains as inequitable as it is. So I think um, um, those kinds of lessons, I think, actually are very useful as um, they move forward in ever complicated times. Thank you. I am really struck by the way in which this was a set of stories about one opening leading to more openings up. That Margaret's story about the importance of looking at women actually opens up the importance of looking at the multiplicity of gendered experience that Denise and Elizabeth and Anna all spoke to the ways in which experience in thinking about gender opens up issues of race and that itself opens up issues of class and that as Bev's work knows opens up issues of power and so that as we think about the women at Yale who came either 50 or 150 years ago as individuals whose particular mode of being wasn't obviously part of the voice of academic undertaking and recognize that any kind of intervention that puts the unexpected into a familiar space is likely to enrich both the individual who arrives new and the work that was continuing. In some sense, all six of us study subjects that were studied at Yale 100 years ago. It's not that we have abandoned the ambitions of the liberal arts, of the humanities, of the social sciences, of the sciences and engineering to illuminate human understanding. 
but the opening up of one door leads to the realization that there are doors and that in fact, the more kinds of voice that we bring into the room, the richer the experience will be. So a great pleasure to have been with Margaret Homan's class of 1974, with Elizabeth Alexander, class of 1984, Ana Ramos-Zayas from the class of 1990, Bev Gage from the class of 1994, and Denise Ho from the class of 2000. And thanks to the Yale Alumni Association for inviting all of us to join. Thank you.